Uh, so let's go ahead and get ready to start this afternoon. I think we're in for you know a really interesting afternoon session. Um, and so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Teresa Good. I am from uh, the Molecular and Cellular Biosciences at NSF, and it is my pleasure to be able to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, um, Araz. A Lieberman Aiden, who's from Baylor College of Medicine, who's going to talk about bottom up modeling of chromosome or chrom oops, wrong talk, wrong title, um, tracking loops through space and time. Sorry about that. Great, thank you guys so much for uh, joining. So uh, the puzzle that I have this afternoon is that I uh, already presented s several lectures at sort of summer school, which was just yesterday. Um, so I kind of want to talk about some of that stuff, but I also want to talk about new stuff. Um, so my really simple solution is I'm just going to talk twice as fast as I did yesterday. <laughs> That's the plan. You've been warned. Okay, so the general problem that we are going to be talking about in this session, that I'm going to be talking about in uh, this talk, is a problem about how the human genome folds and how genomes fold more generally. Uh, you take the human genome, you stretch it out, it's about yay big, but it folds up to fit inside the nucleus of a cell, which is only a few microns wide. So the big question is, how does that work? Uh, and this is a question of great urgency, not just for physicists, but also uh, for people who are interested in cell biology, for people who are interested in the problem of cell state because, as we know, the genome is the same in all the cells in our body, and yet, you know, lung cells help us breathe, the neurons think, uh, and how does all of that work? Well, it works because different genes are on and off, and how is it that genes come to be on and off? Well, uh, it was figured out in the late 70s uh, that there's these funny elements uh, in, uh, in your DNA that can live very, very far from the genes, uh, but can still turn the genes on uh, and off. Initially, there was skepticism about whether this was true and real, uh, but eventually people figured out that it was true and real, so they named these things, they called them enhancers, uh, and they started to speculate as to how in the world this kind of spooky action at a distance could function, and the hypothesis was uh, that enhancers uh, actually formed loops uh, with promoters in 3D. So even though the enhancer was far away in 1D, it was actually very, very close uh, in 3D, and so in that way, uh, it could uh, regulate the gene. Um, so that immediately meant that people wanted to now start mapping uh, these loops, and I would say probably, I mean, there's been a, a tremendous amount of work uh, in this over the years, but I would say that probably the uh, sort of key milestone was a beautiful paper by Catherine Cullen in uh, 1993 in Science, uh, where she was interested in two elements. Uh, we're going to call them Pac-Man and Power-Up, because I don't want to get into biology of what she was looking at, uh, but she was specifically interested in these two elements and whether they formed loops. Uh, and so she said, uh, look, here's an interesting thing. I know that these two elements are, are very close to PST1 restriction sites. So I'm going to do the following trick. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cut the genome with a PST1 restriction enzyme, uh, and I am going to uh, and then introduce some T4 DNA ligase. What T4 DNA ligase does is when it finds free DNA ends, it likes to ligate them together. And she reasoned as follows. She said, look, if Pac-Man is biting down and power up and there's really a loop here, then those DNA ends are going to be really near one another, and I'm going to see lots of these ligation junctions very, very frequently. Otherwise, I'm going to see it less frequently. So if I do appropriate controls, I can tell whether there's a loop or not. And what this tells you is that you can do contact mapping on the human genome. You can figure out if pairs of loci are in contact relative to controls, but it was actually very, very hard to do this uh, a quarter of a century ago. And the reason for that uh, was two basic challenges. The first is that they didn't have a uh, reference genome for the human genome uh, back in 1993. And the second uh, is that uh, quantifying these junctions was really difficult. They do Sanger sequencing, they do gel electrophoresis, but they had to kind of quantify one junction after another. Uh, without cheap DNA sequencing, these kinds of results are very hard to quantify. So uh, anyway, the long and the short is that that combination of restriction followed by ligation works very, very well. Um, it's been, was fiddled with for decades before and has been fiddled with for decades since. Um, I'm not going to uh, take you through all the details because I just went through them uh, sort of yesterday, but in brief, uh, the uh, incarnation of this that we developed uh, in uh, 2009 when I was a grad student, uh, the idea we came up with was, well, maybe it would be possible to map all the ligation junctions at once using this newfangled, really, really inexpensive Illumina sequencing, uh, and basically we just sort of followed the same nuclear ligation assay protocol, uh, cross-linking uh, the DNA, that's in fact uh, not absolutely necessary, um, but you kind of freeze everything in place. You cut with a restriction enzyme. Uh, 
and, and just as before, uh, you then ligate with T4DNA ligase. There's one extra step, which is that you're cutting with a sticky end cutter. You fill in those empty bases with biotinylated bases. What this allows you to do is to fish out the ligation junctions and leave sort of the pure blue, which is uninteresting, the pure uh, red is not so interesting, but where blue meets red, it indicates that, you know, these blue segment and the red segment were in really, really nearby uh, in 3D in the nucleus of the cell. Uh, and so that's the interesting stuff. And so by biotinylating uh, the ends, we can ensure that the ligation junction is biotinylated so we can pull down those biotinylated junctions and sequence it using paired on sequencing. Uh, the first time we did this, we got four sequences. These days we get many billions of sequences. Uh, okay, so what does the data look like? So just uh, very, very briefly, uh, the human genome comprises 23 pairs of chromosomes. Any bit of any of those 23 pairs of chromosomes can, uh, in principle, form contacts with any other bit. Uh, and in practice, that's exactly what you observe here. It's a little bit washed out. Otherwise, you'd see sort of this pinkish background. We're seeing contacts between pairs of chromosomes. But one of the things that's very, very striking uh, that you can observe in this high C map is that there's 23 bright squares. What are those 23 bright squares? Those are the 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, bits of the same chromosome, even if they're at opposite ends of, ends of the chromosome, have an enhanced contact frequency, and so that's why you see these bright squares. Um, that was actually sort of well known uh, for, for decades uh, that chromosomes form these individual territories, which is consistent with that, so it wasn't really a discovery, um, but uh, it was good to see. Um, in general, it's pretty hard to figure out, you know, verify anything anyone's telling you about these things because the matrices are so huge. They contain, you know, at the maximal resolutions that we interrogate them, they contain more pixels and Google Earth images of the surface of the Earth. Um, so it's really hard to recalculate or reproduce anything that anyone's telling you. Uh, so I'm going to do from time to time the talk is just have a QR code there. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you to a website where you can interactively browse our data, uh, the exact data that you're looking at there, change the color map, look at a different region, et cetera, and, you know, just raise your hand immediately and say that um, I'm just BSing. Uh, if I am. Uh, or otherwise, raise your hand and say, I have verified that what you're saying is true. Um, anyway, the fun thing about these uh, matrices is that you can zoom in, right? Because there's lots and lots of pixels. So here we're zooming in on, uh, on chromosome 8. Um, and what you can see is that there's all kinds of intricate patterns, right? These patterns tell us something about the structure of the genome. And also the very overwhelming trend is that as loci get very, very, very close in 1D, the contact frequency skyrockets. Uh, and so what that forms is this very, very bright diagonal along this chromosome. Uh, and every chromosome and every successful high C experiment. Um, so what do these patterns indicate? And, and these are one of the things I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time on today that I didn't have time to talk about yesterday. Of course, I had less time today than yesterday, so that's the puzzle. Uh, but one of the things that you can see, um, I had like a third as much time today as yesterday, but uh, the long and short is one of the things that you can see is this sort of checkerboard kind of pattern. Right? It's, it's not exactly like a checkerboard because some of the checkers are wider and other checkers are thinner, um, but it's sort of a checkerboard-like pattern. We call it a plaid pattern until I looked into Scottish textile production standards, and it turns out it's not actually exactly plaid. In fact, there's no way to make this using current textile production methods. But the long and the short is we call this a plaid pattern, but it's also like a checkerboard pattern. And what it indicates is that you really have two uh, you can partition the genome into two types of loci. Uh, you can call them A-type loci and B-type loci, and what you're seeing is enhanced contact frequency uh, within all the A-type loci and enhanced contact frequency within uh, the B-type loci, but loci that are of different type have actually diminished contact frequency uh, with respect to one another, and that gives rise uh, to the checkerboard. Um, and uh, we call that phenomenon compartmentalization. Uh, we were actually able to assign uh, the genome at about 100 KB resolution, at 100 KB resolution to what we call A and B compartments. It turns out that the A and B compartments uh, align really, really well with euchromatin and heterochromatin, open and closed chromatin. Um, and in fact, the domain size that we're able to uh, do this at was about 100 kilobases. Uh, this was back in 2009. Uh, subsequently, with much, much better maps, we were actually able to figure out that instead of there being two types, there are actually many more types. Uh, and so we could e take each of these, you know, 100 kilobase intervals and actually give them, you know, an assignment instead of to one of two types, to, to one of six uh, different types. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. We'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, but that's the phenomenon of compartmentalization, where you see similar types of chromatin tend to co-segregate uh, in the nucleus of a cell. So now what we want to do is focus on uh, the problem of mapping loops. Um, how, just so that I know exactly what speed factor to engage. How many people were at yesterday's talk? All right. Well, that's about half. So 
Um, so I'm not completely sure what to do, but I'll just continue talking fast, and, and we'll see how it goes. So, uh, so the long and the short is that if you are trying to map loops, uh, the kind of maps that we were producing initially was just not nearly good enough, um, because you could see at chromosome scale they looked good, um, but the problem is genes are very small with respect to chromosomes, and so what you want to be able to do is sort of zoom down uh, to gene scale, uh, but you can see at the scale of individual genes, right, if they keep zooming in, right, the data looks terrible. There were a lot of efforts to improve this, but they were not, uh, you know, they, they didn't change the overall gestalt, although they did improve uh, things a bit, but they didn't change this overall trend. Uh, and then we developed this method called in situ high C, where we did all of the steps in, in the previous uh, protocol, actually, uh, as they were done in the original nuclear ligation assay, um, but as they hadn't been done for uh, some time thereafter uh, and in the initial high C protocol. So we did them in intact nuclei. By doing things in intact nuclei, uh, all of a sudden we could start to see these beautiful uh, local maxima popping out. And if you think about that, what does it mean to see a local maxima in a high C matrix? It, what it's telling you is that there's a pair of loci that form contacts with one another quite frequently, but the adjacent loci in 1D don't form contacts at nearly, uh, nearly as high rates. So what that's telling you uh, is that you are seeing uh, a loop, so a pair of loci that tend to form loops uh, within uh, the nucleus of the cell. And I, I want to just give you a sense of uh, scale of this data. So we produced about five terabases of data. So this is, you know, roughly half as much data as released, I think, in the uh, second production phase of the ENCODE project, the NIH ENCODE project. So just give people a bit of a sense of scale. Um, is about uh, an order of magnitude more data than all high C maps that have been published up to that time. We actually shared it openly and interactively using the juice box software so people could actually zoom in and out of these matrices really, really easily and explore them on their own and, and come up with their own discoveries. Okay, um, so what, what about these loops? So one of the things that was really, really striking is that as soon as we, uh, that as soon as we started mapping these loops, um, we started to notice that overwhelmingly uh, there were three proteins that we found uh, located uh, at, at the sites of these loop anchors. The pair of loci that are connected, we call those loop anchors. And you can see CTCF and RAD21 and SMC3. Uh, CTCF uh, was not so surprising. CTCF is widely thought of as an insulator uh, protein. It's thought to establish regulatory environments in the genome by demarcating uh, different domains. Um, and specifically, we thought to do this potentially via CTCF, CTCF loops. So we weren't totally shocked to find CTCF there. We were a bit more uh, surprised to find RAD21 and SMC3 there because those are associated with the uh, donut shaped cohesin complex, uh, which was largely thought to be a uh, participant in sister chromatid cohesion and not in interphase loop making and things like that. Uh, so that was a bit of a surprise. The other thing that was very, very, very surprising to us uh, was uh, the following. So CTCF does not bind to the human genome willy-nilly, it binds to a particular motif, a particular set of about 10 or 15 base pairs. Um, and uh, so if you have a pair of these motifs, they can be in four different configurations. Either they can both point forward or both point in reverse, or they can point away from one another, the divergent orientation, or they can point towards one another, the convergent orientation. What was really striking is, as you can see here in this particular example, the uh, you know, upstream motif is pointing downstream, the downstream motif is pointing upstream, both motifs are pointing inward into the loop, uh, in the convergent orientation. This is a nice example of a loop in the convergent orientation. In fact, over 90% of the loops that we annotated had the CTCFs in the convergent orientation. Um, <clears throat> actually, when we first got that result, I basically kind of, you know, talked to, to the person who initially did that analysis, said, well, look, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, and there must be a bug in your code uh, because, you know, that's intuitively impossible. Um, and so they went and checked but they couldn't find a bug in the code. That was fine because it only took them a week to do that. And, and so in that week, I actually came up with a much more inspiring speech about the importance of not embarrassing their lab and in wasting the time of your peers by putting in results that are clearly intuitively impossible. So then they were even more motivated to find the bug in their code. Um, but they still couldn't find the bug in their code. So I kept rehearsing the speech. It got really, really good by the end. But anyway, we never found the bug in the code. Um, so, it, so it seems like that's the case. It seems like these motifs have to point uh, inward, they have to be in the convergent orientation. Now, why is it that it was so counterintuitive that they were in the convergent orientation? The reason is uh, that pretty much everyone thought that loops formed by diffusion. So, so what's the diffusion model? Uh, the diffusion model is I've got two <coughs> looping factors, and they somehow find their sites on the genome, and then the genome just sort of fluctuates and fluctuates and fluctuates and fluctuates, because that's what genomes do, uh, and all of a sudden they find themselves uh, adjacent uh, in, in 3D, and so they decide to hold hands. Um, great. So if you believe in the diffusion model, it's incredibly hard to understand how in the world things can be in the convergent orientation. I just want to give you a sense of scale. You blow everything up by a factor of a million, 
the CTCF protein is about the size of a P. The uh, interval uh, between a pair of CTCF proteins in a looping configuration can be uh, kilometers long. So how in the world do these P two P-sized proteins figure out whether they're, in, for instance, in this configuration at the top, uh, which is convergent, versus that configuration at the bottom, which is divergent? We could not think of how that could possibly be, and yet we saw this 300-fold more often than we saw that in the raw data. Uh, we had no idea what was going on, so we made something up. Here's what we made up. We said, we know donuts are involved, so let's imagine a two-donut machine. We're going to call it the extrusion complex because it sounds better, some more science-y than two-donut machine. Anyway, the two donuts are tethered to one another, and they land on the genome. And the two donuts both start sliding in opposite directions. Of course, cohesin is a donut-shaped complex, so donut is not very arbitrary. Right now, of course, uh, if I'm driving, I don't want to drive forever. Eventually, I want to stop. And when do I stop? I stop for stop signs. But I don't stop for all stop signs. I only stop for stop signs that are pointing towards me. Um, so here, look, that donut is arriving at a stop sign pointing towards it. It's going to stop. The other donut hasn't seen a stop sign. It keeps going. Now, all of a sudden, it sees a stop sign pointing the wrong way. It's not going to stop. Now it sees a stop sign pointing inward. It's going to stop. So he said, look, um, if a machine like that existed, it would form loops between motifs in the convergent orientation. Uh, we felt really good uh, that that was the case. We felt even better after we made this uh, massive Technicolor video, even though we weren't really entitled to because we still had not a shred of physical evidence that this was true. Um, okay, so then um, uh, Therese announced that I was going to do some bottom-up modeling. So here's some bottom-up modeling. We decided we're going to do some bottom-up modeling. It's actually it's not really bottom-up. It's like middle-up modeling. So what we did is we said, all right, we don't understand how any of this stuff works, but let's try to check basic plausibility. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate chromatin in sort of a bath of these, these simplified extrusion complexes, these two tethered donuts that like to sort of uh, extrude. Um, and then we said, let's see, let's see if this works well. So first we did something very, very cautious. We said, look, let's take a CTCF chip seek track. Uh, which tells us exactly where CTCF binds. Then let's look at the genome, and that's going to tell us for each CTCF motif which way the CTCF motif is pointing. Is it in the reverse orientation or in the forward orientation? And what that gives us is it gives us an idealized polymer model of uh, chromatin as well as the stop signs and the orientations of the stop signs on the chromatin. And so we said, now let's then simulate how that uh, polymer ought to behave. And what we do with that is we produce these, uh, these 3D structures and then we generate ensembles of these 3D structures, and we would look at the actual contact frequency matrix. So what you're looking at here, there's a little computer icon. This is a simulation, right? So, so this involved, uh, you know, zero cells, and um, you know, no, uh, you know, data was generated, anything like that. It was just a uh, really uh, brilliant student who wrote a few lines of code and pressed enter. Uh, and was able to figure out what this locus ought to do. And then we compare it uh, at bottom. I mean, this was like, I don't know, 50 person years of work and like a quarter of a million dollars of sequencing alone. Uh, and they look pretty much identical. Um, so some days I wake up and I think, wow, that's like a triumph. Um, and then some days I wake up and I find that really depressing. Um, so I suspect actually as a physicist, one would find that like good news and maybe as an experimentalist, one would find that bad news. I'm not sure. I, I keep thinking about this. But anyway, the long and short is that this made us confident that these simulations were not performing, uh, you know, we're not doing nothing at all. Uh, so I'm not going to take you guys through this slide in quite as much detail uh, as, as I did yesterday. But then we started to say, okay, now let's not just recapitulate data we already have. Let's actually explicitly re-engineer loci uh, and see what happens. Uh, so we started to take these transitive triples. Um, and uh, you know, at this particular region, the trans what the transitive triple uh, does is you can see that there's a loop between A and B, there's a loop between A and C, and there's a loop between B and C. And so what you would expect uh, in a configuration like this, according to the convergent rule, is A has a forward-oriented motif because it's looping two downstream loci, C has a reverse-oriented motif because it's looping two upstream loci, and B has motifs going in both directions because it's looping both upstream and downstream. Uh, and in fact, that's overwhelmingly what you observe at these kinds of transit triples. Uh, and so what that allowed us to do is to start futzing around with the motifs. So uh, one of the things we did is we, uh, and we were doing very, very targeted CRISPR um, deletions. So we're taking out as little as a single base pair, tops 100 base pairs, but this is very targeted. So we thought very, very little collateral damage was being done. So this is just, uh, you know, a review for people who are here. Uh, yesterday, but just to demonstrate, it's really easy to pick, pick up on. So if you delete this motif at A, uh, which loops ought to go away? 
that's right, A, B, and A, C should go away. That's what our simulations predict. And I want to highlight these simulations were done chronologically prior to the experiment. Uh, and that's, in fact, exactly what we observe. Uh, so that's good. What about if we get rid of the B reverse motif? What should, we, what should happen to loops? Uh, that's right. So you should get AC and BC, but you should lose AB. In fact, that's exactly what we observe. Uh, what if we get rid of the B forward? What's that? That's right. So you should keep AB and AC. You should lose B to C. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. Uh, if you invert uh, B forward, what does that do? Same. same thing. Exactly right. Inverting the B forward motif does the same thing as uh, deleting it. And this is really, really striking. I mean, because all we're doing here is we're taking 20 base pairs and we're actually inverting the orientation. No base pairs are disappearing. No motifs are disappearing. <laughs> and yet the loop goes away. So it highlights the importance of orientation. Uh, because changing the orientation of the motif uh, is the same effect as actually deleting the motif. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, once we delete the B reverse motif, the B forward motif uh, is kind of like a switch. When it's pointing forward, you get the B to C loop. And if you flipped it to point reverse, then you would predict that you'd lose the B to C loop and rescue the A to B loop. And in fact, that's exactly what we, what we observe. Um, so at that point, we felt confident enough that the extrusion model was making some accurate predictions. And so uh, we proposed that this was what was going on. Um, I should say that while our paper was in review, um, a, a, a really nice perspective piece from Victor Corsa's group uh, appeared in the cell, and then uh, shortly thereafter, a bioarchive piece uh, appeared from the Murney lab, uh, also speculating on the convergent rule and, and proposing uh, an extrusion-like model. Um, and then our, uh, our paper appeared shortly thereafter in PNAS. Um, so there's a lot of material on this. I also want to highlight that Kim Naismith, who's one of the pioneers of the uh, cohesin field, actually proposed uh, that SMC complexes, the family of complexes that includes cohesin, uh, would form, uh, could form loops via extrusion during metaphase. Um, and, and we actually, when we, when we read that during this whole, uh, whole process, we also started to feel a bit more confident about this model. Okay, so now I want to tell you about um, exploring loops in, in space and in time. Uh, so first, let's start by talking about loops in space. So a ba basic question that you might be asking at this point is I told you a whole bunch of stuff and uh, talked a good game about loops. Um, but yet, I don't know, is this all a hallucination? Does the high C maps actually accurately reflect uh, 3D uh, genome architecture? And I want to highlight that there are two recent papers. Sorry, this is a 2018 paper uh, that I think pretty decisively have uh, resolved this sort of question. Um, well, what these papers do uh, is really interesting. So in the past, it has been possible to figure out the position, the spatial position of particular locus in the genome using fluorescent in situ hybridization. You set, take a set of probes, you hybridize them uh, against the genome. They are fluorescent, so you can watch the fluorescence. That gives you an XYZ position. Uh, what these papers are able to do uh, is to wash off that set of probes, that first set of probes, and then wash on a new set of probes and repeat. So you can uh, figure out the location of one locus, and then another locus, and then a third locus, and a fourth locus. And then this way, you can trace out a whole chromosome. So you can see here, uh, nine loci in a row, tracing out one homolog, tracing out the other homolog. Um, so, so that's an example of a trace. Uh, and then one can actually now explicitly and uh, using these traces measure the overlap frequency, the likelihood that a pair of loci are within, say, a threshold of 150 nanometers in this particular case uh, of one another in the microscopy trace and compare that to the high C data. So on the right is the high C data that we published in 2014. On the left is trace data. Uh, actually, this was from a uh, paper from Bintu uh, and others. Uh, and they're both calculated at the same, same resolution. Uh, and you can see that all of the features that are seen in the high CMAP are, are beautifully recapitulated in the microscopy data, uh, including the loops. I apologize, the loops aren't, don't pop out quite as nicely here because this is lower resolution than our high CMAPs, uh, but they're working quickly to improve uh, the resolution, as are we. Um, so our paper was in, uh, in collaboration with uh, groups of uh, Ting Wu and Mark Marty Renov. It's really Ting Wu, a brilliant microscopist at Harvard who kind of pioneered this uh, from our end. Uh, and what you can see, uh, using this is now, instead of being limited only to the high C visualization, right, here's a particular loop, now we can actually look at the two loop anchors and watch how the loop is swept out in, uh, in three dimensions using uh, this technique. So that's an example of one loop. That is, here's an example uh, of, an, of another loop. So now we're very, very confident that when we say something is a loop, it's really forming these loops in 3D, and we can figure out exactly what the shape of these loops is uh, in 3D. Okay, so next what I want to do is talk about uh, exploring these loops uh, over time. Um, so the proposal that loops formed by extrusion led to lots and lots of uh, 
work to try to validate this hypothesis. A lot of these experiments have gone surprisingly well because um, we, were, we were pretty nervous that this was going to be sort of dead on delivery. Uh, but it's actually gone, gone surprisingly well. Um, and I'm going to tell you about just some of the work that we've done uh, in, in my group uh, towards this end. So specifically, uh, what I've been talking about before is sort of futzing around with the CTCF motif, but now I'm going to talk about futzing around with the extrusion complex. And, and the clear idea here is the extrusion complex, if, if, if instead of disrupting a particular CTCF motif, what I can actually do is get rid of the extrusion complex, I ought to be able to simultaneously get rid of all of the loops across the genome all at once. Um, thing we got really stuck on was it was very, very hard to get rid of a sufficient fraction, let's say you used RNAi uh, or various different sorts of techniques. You know, we always got left with some residual quantity of these extrusion complexes. We couldn't get rid of like really all of the cohesin uh, and we didn't see much of an effect. Um, and then finally, we, we actually got this Degron system from the Kanemaki group in Japan. Um, and it was just terrific and really got rid of, we think like more than 99% uh, of the cohesin. Uh, and, and the way that this works uh, is use the plant hormone auxin, um, and on exposure to auxin, uh, the tagged protein, uh, in this case RAD21, is degraded. This is a system in HCT116 cells. Um, and so you could very, very rapidly degrade RAD21. Um, now I want to highlight, here you see the loops. Uh, loops are often associated with domains, so these very bright squares. Uh, and so before we did this treatment, um, our algorithms, so we're not tuning any parameters, et cetera. These are the algorithms that we've always used or the parameters we've always used on them. Uh, annotated like 3,300 of these loop domains. Uh, after six hours of treatment with auxin, this is what the maps look like. There are nine loop domains annotated. They're all computational artifacts if you look at them carefully. If you, if you scan that QR code when I'm not standing in front of it, uh, you can browse around and, and see that this is not a particular coincidental region or something like that. If you go across the genome and you can find the loop domain, I'll give you 10 bucks. Um, no, I mean, you should write a communication to sell or something uh, if you do, but I don't know. Uh, I give you more, but my wife has told me I have to stop doing that in talks. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, the nice thing about this is that you could be, by controlling the auxin, uh, I mean, I have more certainty than 10 bucks worth of certainty. I want to make that clear, but I also, <laughs> I'm married, right? So, um, so anyway, the nice thing about the auxin uh, is that you can withdraw the auxin and then the cohesin comes back. And so you now have this ability to control uh, the presence or absence of the cohesin, the presence or absence of the loops. Um, and, and what's really, really neat is you see all these loop domains disappear and they all uh, rapidly come back. You can, of course, see that there are some domains that actually remain regardless because these are not loop domains. They have nothing to do with extrusion. They are formed by the compartmentalization mechanism. Uh, and then what's really nice about this is it gives you the ability to figure out how fast. I mean, if these things are forming by extrusion, you can now figure out how fast uh, they're forming. So for instance, that particular loop is about 900 kilobases long. It's largely reformed within 40 minutes. So long division tells you that the loop extrusion has to be happening at least 400 bases a second. The other thing that's very striking is actually all the loops are not forming at the same rate. So we can actually uh, figure out all the reformation rates of every single loop genome-wide uh, and associate that with all sorts of uh, genomic factors, but I don't have time to tell you about that. Um, instead, what I want to do is actually want to tell you about something else. So, so we figured that actually kind of all the loops would go away, but something, uh, something happened that uh, surprised us. I didn't have a chance to get into uh, yesterday, but I think is really relevant to some of the themes uh, of this meeting, uh, which is that we found that there was actually a second kind of loop. So here's an interesting thing. Uh, so here, and th these maps are a little bit different than uh, what you've seen before. So here, what we are looking at um, is a series of a couple dozen loci uh, spanning nine different chromosomes. Each of these little panels is showing you a megabase by megabase interval around uh, the locus of interest. Um, and what you can see is below the diagonal is these loci prior to cohesin treatment. Above the diagonal is these loci after cohesin treatment. Uh, and what these loci, in fact, are is uh, super enhancers. Uh, so K27 acetylated, uh, long K27 acetylated regions. Uh, and what you can see is that these super enhancers, whether they're on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes, seem to come together uh, after you degrade cohesin. And they come together in a very punctate and focal way, forming intrachromosomal loops and interchromosomal links. Uh, so that was, that was really quite surprising. Uh, one thing that's really remarkable about this is how fast all of this happens. So, so this is an aggregate plot of all of these uh, of all of these cohesin-independent loops, and you can see within, uh, within an hour, they are uh, sort of largely formed after cohesin treatment. So these loci are finding themselves, uh, are finding one another very, very, very quickly. Um, we asked ourselves the following question. I think I have time to tell you about it. 
So one thing we were wondering about is do, you know, are these things like a, is this a pairwise relationship like with loop extrusion where the two uh, ends of loop come together or is this sort of a higher order relationship where many loci can come together all at once? Uh, and so what we did is we looked at higher order contact. So we use high C and other variant uh, protocols like COLA that we've developed uh, to look at higher order contacts where you're looking at instead of pairs, at triples of loci or quadruples of loci. Uh, instead of a contact matrix, you get what we call a contact tensor. Instead of a diagonal, you get this n-dimensional hyperstar. You get a lot of great jargon. Um, anyway, so that's what it sort of looks like. That's what the data looks like. This is the exact equivalent of the contact matrix just in, in th for the 3D tensor. Uh, and here I'm just looking at the triple data uh, that we have. And so what we did is we looked for triples of loci. We tried to see are these, you know, triples of these super enhancers coming together. So is it just pairs of super enhancers that come together or is it triples, quadruples, et cetera, of super enhancers that, uh, that come together? Um, and we couldn't, we don't have the resolution of these experiments look at each super enhancer triple, but we can look at all of them in aggregate. Uh, and so you can see all of them in aggregate is represented by the middle of this sort of volume. I, I apologize, it's a little bit washed out here, so you can't quite see it. But in the middle of this sort of volume, what you're not seeing is a lack of enrichment uh, of these triple contacts between uh, three super enhancers. Uh, three super enhancers coming together all at once. But of course, we're not surprised to not be seeing uh, enrichment because this is before we treat with uh, auxin. So this is in the presence of cohesin. You don't see those loops in that setting. Once we treat with cohesin, all of a sudden, we see uh, 11 reads in the center voxel. Um, that's a really unimpressive number, but I should tell you that like statistically, um, that's crushingly impressive. Uh, there's no other voxel um, that has anything close to 11 reads. Anyway, suffice so to say the fact that it has 11 reads tells you why we don't do tons of this sort of triple work because it's very, very hard to get good statistics. But the long and the short is that you are very, very clearly seeing here that you're getting higher order hubs that involve not just two, but multiple three, uh, you know, three or potentially more uh, super enhancers all coming together. So, so taken together, these loops are actually very different than the previous loops that I was telling you about. Um, so, so the loop domains, they require cohesion, they require CTCF in the convergent orientation. You don't see these very, very large cliques. You don't see interchromosomal links. Uh, the cohesin independent loops are very, very different. They don't seem to require cohesin. Indeed, they're antagonized by cohesin. They don't require convergent CTCF sites. They form these massive cliques. They form interchromosomal links. And indeed, they form higher order hubs. Um, so these things look very, very, very different. Uh, how are they forming? Well, we talked about compartmentalization. Compartmentalization is not lost after you degrade cohesin. In fact, it gets, uh, uh, it gets uh, significantly uh, stronger after cohesin degradation. So if you sort of, uh, you know, kind of compare that map to that map or uh, that map to that map, you can see the, the compartmentalization is actually much stronger. Um, and so what we think is actually happening is that these super enhancers are coming together through a compartmentalization like mechanism, phase separation, or something like that being a reasonable explanatory candidate. Okay, so now I want to tell you, uh, so we talked a bit about compartmentalization, we've talked about another kind of loops. I also want to start to get at function because I think there's been a lot of surprises, uh, at least we've been surprised, uh, by some of the results that we've had uh, on function. So one of the big questions is what do loops do? And we started talking about this you know, notion that loops are involved in regulating promoters and enhancers, and there were some pretty darn specific predictions uh, that folks had uh, about what you would see uh, if you disrupted uh, for instance, all of the loop domains. Uh, and there were two classes of predictions. One thing that you expected is that you would see uh, many genes uh, actually have, uh, you know, fold change reductions in uh, expression. So tenfold or twentyfold. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, conversely, people expect that you see lots of ectopic activation. So genes that are turning on uh, because an enhancer can reach them that maybe couldn't reach them before. Uh, and the reason for that is manifold, but we were kind of expecting something like that. And here's an example why. So here's GM12878 and IMR90. Um, GM12878 lymphoblastoid cells, IMR90 is a lung fibroblast. Uh, look at the gene uh, Adam TS1. Uh, it's off in GM12878, very boring 3D structure. Uh, in IMR90, uh, Adam TS1 is transcribed like gangbusters. There's a very jazzy 3D structure uh, where you're seeing these convergent rules, CTCF mediated loops between a CTCF site and the promoter of Adam TS1 and six uh, distal CTCF sites, all in the conversion orientation, spanning over 2.2 megabases. So when you look at this, right, it's not, it's correlation, it's not causation, but it's very, very hard uh, to avoid thinking that, gosh, um, what's happening is that these loops form and they cause the transcription of Adam TS1. Um, and so we're very surprised to find that when we uh, disrupted cohesin, uh, we found only about, you know, 
50 or so genes that changed more than twofold. So the vast majority of genes uh, didn't exhibit those kinds of changes. You saw lots of changes in the 10 to 30 percent range, uh, but almost no uh, fold changes of any kind. Certainly large fold changes were not seen at all. Um, this has subsequently been doing some work with Matthias Merkenschlager, really led by his lab, um, to recapitulate essentially a very similar result uh, in, in primary cells. The effects are a little bit stronger, but, but the gestalt is, is generally the same. Uh, that was pretty shocking. Um, I have only 43 seconds uh, left in my scheduled talk, so I, I really am not going to dwell on the shock. Uh, and instead, I want to give you uh, an example, uh, because, but, but the shocking thing is like, you know, the loops are likely involved in transcriptional regulation, but the effects are much more modest than we expected, opening up the possibility that there may also be other functions, and maybe even those other functions are the primary functions uh, of the loop domains. And uh, so I wanted to close by giving you an example of a case where we actually have a pretty good idea of um, a, a set of uh, convergent rule CTCF mediated loops uh, that actually have a function. Um, and it's probably not one that you would expect, so, so I want to just quickly talk you through it uh, because I think it's actually really cool. Um, so, so I'll just kind of close, close with this. So one of the things we noticed in our um, in situ high C data in 2014 is that sometimes you see these stripes. So here's like a stripe, and there's a stripe. So you just browse around, you sometimes see these stripes, and why was that? And we couldn't find really, you know, knock down statistical explanations of why you got stripes at particular places. Um, we had this hypothesis which was that uh, stripes could be formed by loop guns. That's just a word I made up because I, I like how it sounds. But anyway, the idea was this. Like, imagine if cohesin loaded very, very, very close to a loop anchor. Then one ring would quickly slide the loop anchor and just sort of get stuck there. And the other ring would you know, keep going on and on and on and on and could form a stripe. And so we did some simulations uh, where we said, OK, you know, let's, let's you know, here this middle domain doesn't have a distinguished cohesin loading site, it loads cohesin randomly. But these other two domains, you can see there's NIPBL, which is the cohesin loading factor. Right here, it's you know, next to one anchor, and right here, it's next to the other. And so you can see in the simulations uh, the formation of these stripes. Uh, so we wanted to test this, but the problem is that we couldn't get a NIPBL antibody that was any good. Um, and so we reached out to Rafael Caselis' group uh, at NIH, and they're really, uh, they're really terrific. And they actually had a wonderful antibody uh, for, for NIPBL. Uh, and so finally, we could do these sorts of experiments. Um, and it turned out that that actually does explain many of the stripes. Not all the stripes, but many of the stripes are actually explained by this mechanism. Uh, so you can see here's the CTCF track. Here's the NIPBL track. So for instance, you look at that particular stripe. You see that CTCF. And then you know, pointing, what you, what you really have here is uh, the, the motif is sort of pointing at the cohesin loading site. So that's what I call a loop gun. It's like a CTCF site that's pointing right at a uh, cohesin loading site. Uh, and then it, it sort of shoots you know, these sort of loops across the stripe, right? if, you, if, you, if you see what I mean. Um, and so you know, we could actually kind of confirm that hypothesis. It was great working with Raphael. And in fact, you really do see that there is uh, much more. When, when there is a stripe present, NIPBL tends to be much higher uh, you know, sort of in, you know, associated with the, in the anchor that you would expect it to be associated with. Um, okay, so, so that's interesting. So we could explain a, a fair number of stripes that way. It doesn't work as well as the convergent rule by any stretch. Uh, still, we could explain a fair number of stripes that way. And so now I want to just tell you, uh, sort of in closing, about this closing, closing phenomenon, uh, which you may have heard of, which is VDJ recombination. So all the biologists certainly will will know about this. This is where your antibodies come from. So the way that you, you, know, you have all kinds of different uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that your immune system has to deal with. Um, and so it has to be prepared for all this stuff. And the way that it does this is it, it can't encode enough genes to have all the antibodies that you need. Instead, it picks a sort of a V segment and a D segment, a J segment from this gene superfamily. Um, and then you know, kind of combines these cassettes to make a new gene. And then there's this great combinatorial complexity. And the way that it picks these things is actually by cutting out Ds and Js or Vs and Ds. Uh, and it actually forms a loop in order to, to excise these regions. It forms a loop to excise these regions. So we're very interested in how in the world this works. This is a kind of case where loops were kind of doing something. It's really striking to look at the data. So this is a, the 2.2 MB uh, interval of uh, uh, the VDJ locus. Um, and what you can see in red and blue are the CTCF motifs. Uh, and it's all it's drawn to scale in terms of length. And so what you're actually seeing here is 109 uh, CTCF motifs in a row, all in the forward orientation, right? I mean, just from the standpoint of like randomness, this is like flipping a coin 
and having it land on heads 109 times in a row. It's very, very unlikely. Then you see a reverse, then a forward, and then you see 10 reverse CTCF motifs all in a row uh, at the very, very end of the locus. Uh, and so you see this whole V region actually has, uh, has all of these CTCFs. Um, and then if you zoom in on this, uh, 10 reverse, these 10 reverse motifs, which are called a super anchor, uh, what you actually see is there's a super anchor right here. And right upstream of the super anchor is the only NIPBL, the only cohesin loading sites in this whole interval. By far the strongest ones, pretty much the only ones, are right here. Uh, and then when you look at the high C matrix, you see this massive stripe spanning multiple megabases. So what's happening, right, is uh, we think the data is consistent with you're having the cohesin loads here, right, the extrusion complex loads here, one subunit very quickly slides, uh, you know, a couple of kilobases down to the super anchor, and the other subunit starts this voyage all along the VDJ locus. And in this way, it can actually facilitate the formation of loops between uh, VD and J loci. So this made us start to think about, well, gosh, maybe uh, loops uh, are somehow associated with the formation of double strand breaks, which would be helpful in this. Uh, and indeed, uh, and this was work really led by Vanessa Zweig and Casella's lab, but we, we worked closely with them uh, on this. So we looked at loop anchors in the presence of, uh, you know, end seek, uh, basically a method designed to map where double strand breaks tend to form in the presence of a top aside. Uh, and what you can see is these these bright peaks where double strand breaks uh, tend to form, and they're really right on top of the loop anchor. So we actually think that uh, extrusion in the sort of standard sense uh, is facilitating the formation of double strand breaks in the context of VDJ uh, recombination. Anyway, as before, all of our protocols are public. Well, we have all kinds of published software and public software to do what, I mean, anything I've shown you, you can do in an automatic way with our software. Um, and, uh, and if you find that you can't, then you can complain about it at this forum joining hundreds of other people complaining about it all the time. Uh, but, you know, I think on the whole, you know, like it, it kind of works. Um, you know, if, if you're wondering when, whether there'll be high C data relevant to your system, if there isn't already, we're currently doing actually an atlas of the human body, many different hematopoietic cell types, uh, as well as many different tissues as part of the ENCODE project. So that should be uh, coming online soon. We're very, very grateful to all these funders who picked up various uh, projects in the group. Uh, and let us run with them. I'm incredibly grateful to our many collaborators. Uh, Ting Wu is really the sort of pioneer uh, of, of these microscopy methods. We, we had the real privilege of working with her. Uh, Mark Marty Renham uh, as well. Guy Neer and Irena Farabella were, were the uh, co-first authors on that. Laura Vian um, and Kyung Grim uh, and Alex helped lead uh, this work on stripes that I was telling you about uh, in the Casellas group um, and then uh, in my group. Uh, all the nuclear architecture work I talked about at that. The beginning was really led by Adrian Sanborn, Suas Rao, and Miriam Huntley. Suas and Miriam worked on the loop mapping, did amazing work on that, and Adrian and Suhas uh, worked on uh, uh, sorting out and figuring out the extrusion uh, mechanism and, and, and proving that it was a viable option. Uh, and, you know, we benefit from a, a tremendous number of collaborations that really uh, enables to come up with new theoretical, conceptual ideas uh, at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. Um, at uh, Rice University in BCM, so I'm very grateful for uh, all of our collaborators there. Um, and I'm currently hiring postdocs in Houston and Shanghai, as I was in both of my talks yesterday. So anyway, um, that's all I have to say. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. and still be intelligent. So that was, that was impressive. So we have time for a couple of questions. And while we're answering or doing those, then can we have Irina come up and, yep. So, more questions. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. But uh, I ask you, have you observed in your life <laughs> directly chromosome looping? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <clears throat> because uh, simulation deviated from the reality. You know, you know that this uh, information is not exact. That uh, have in the uh, have you pictures to demonstrate? Yeah, so, so that's a terrific question. So, so I would say that the talk very broadly uh, presents three lines of argument um, about the evidence for loops at the positions that we claim. One is we, that's the interpretation that we give for our high C data. Um, the second is that that interpretation is consistent with the simulations. Uh, the third is that when we do these serial fish experiments, and I apologize, I went, I went through 
uh, pretty quickly. But when we do these serial fish experiments where you illuminate one locus after another and can trace out the contours of a chromosome, you indeed do see that between the pair of loop anchors annotated by high C, there's an elevated contact frequency that is, you know, corresponds to the observation in those experiments of an enhanced rate of formation of topological loops between the loop anchors themselves. So I would say at that point, I am, I am pretty satisfied that there's no other interpretation, um, that there is no other interpretation really of the data that I think is very plausible, but that's probably a dangerous place for me to be. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you.